we're talking about service learning and American Indian studies at UNCP. The goal is indigenous community empowerment through local and global education. It's campus to community. It's campus to community. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Hannah Baggett Anderson, lecturer of English and Literacy Commons faculty fellow here at UNCP. With me today to talk about American Indian Studies and Service Learning is Dr. Jane Halliday, professor in AIS. Thanks for joining me today, Jane. Well, thank you, Hannah. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, our first question to begin, can you tell us a little bit generally about the goals of service learning and American Indian Studies? Um, service learning in American Indian Studies we think is really significant because one of the core values of the discipline of American Indian Studies is to serve the local Native community um, on its own terms uh, wherever a particular institution is housed in a Native community. So rather than just kind of staying focused on books in the classroom, which are valuable of course, um, we want to be able to take some of our knowledge and um, expertise out into the community and, and partner with groups who might both benefit um, from exchanges with our students and also teach us things as well. So we've been able to do that in a couple of different classes mm -hmm. in AIS. One of them is um, in the Intro to American Indian Studies class. That's a 1,000 level um, course. We like doing service learning in that course because we have a lot of first year students. Mm -hmm. And some of the research has shown that when first year students um, find some way to connect to the local community, that's um, important for retaining them mm -hmm. in institutions and it also just helps students especially not from this community to get to know community members and, and do certain activities out in the community and it lets our community partners know about our students at UNCP as well. Mm -hmm. The other course that I've been teaching uh, as a service learning course for the past I think four years now is my Native American literature course. Mm. And that one um, I, I particularly enjoy because my, my area of specialty is Native American literature. So for that course, uh, we have been partnering with Union Elementary School in Roland for the past few years. And what my students do in my Native Lit class is um, together we read a Native American children's book in the classroom. The students in groups prepare a lesson plan and um, I'm, you know, I have it very structured so that they feel comfortable because they're obviously, they're not all education majors and right. et cetera. And some of them at first when they hear they're doing this, they're like, oh, I don't even like little kids. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's such a warm, fuzzy uh, event. It ends up being very positive for everyone. So we take the lesson plan into the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, we customarily have gone for two visits my students read the book with the uh, Union Elementary students and then ask them some questions. And then based on the theme of the book, um, we ask the third graders to write stories that are related to the theme. So for some of these books, it's been a uh, connection to the land. Maybe that's a theme in one of the children's books. So the students will write it about an important place to them. Mm. Um, one of the books was about um, animals. We had them write about it an important animal that they liked. And then, of course, they want to do drawings, so we do artwork as well. Uh -huh. Then we gather up all of the um, artwork and uh, writing uh -huh. and bring it back. And I have a, a service learning teaching assistant who helps input all of that material. And we actually publish it in a like a glossy book uh -huh. through our print services here and go back to Union and give all the kids a copy of the book. and. Uh, they are so excited to see their story and feel like published writers. Right. Um, so it's been a very positive experience. We got disrupted recently because of the hurricane, but mm -hmm. we've been able to reschedule. So we'll be going there this time in November. That's awesome. So the yeah. pictures that you have that you brought for us today are these <clears throat> from previous semester? Yes, those are from uh, actually last spring's mm -hmm. Native American literature class. Um, and there are four third grade classes, so I divide my class up into four groups and they each go into one of the classrooms. Mm -hmm. And um, the students, the, the third grade students, they bond so quickly with the UNCP students. And so some of those students, as I was saying, who are hesitant about 
working with kids, they come away feeling so positive about themselves as a role model. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the, the younger kids will say, like, I can't wait to go to college. I'm going to go to UNCP. So, I mean, you really couldn't. Um, it, it, we, honestly, we've never had a bad experience there. That's and the so teachers great. are very appreciative and very positive to work with. So. Uh -huh. Definitely something that makes us feel like we have a real community collaboration. Right. Yeah. Because not only are you serving this particular group of students, right, in this particular class, but then the college students, and this is in your literature course, yes. you're not just hitting AIS majors, right? Exactly. What there are very few AIS majors uh -huh. because the class is a general ed, um, 2000 level lit class, uh -huh. all kinds of students take it. So, so you're hitting a wide variety of people that get to interact yes. with a local community. Yes. Um, in that sense too, I wonder, <clears throat> or I assume, at least in my experience with teaching, that those from Robeson County, or even just from the Lumbee community, um, are kind of more in tune with AIS classes. But I also hear, or I have heard, that people from all kinds of demographics really do benefit from these kinds of courses. Yes. Do you have anything to say in terms of that? Well, it's been interesting. This is my 13th year here, mm -hmm. and I'm not from this community, and I'm not native. Um, but so I've heard all kinds of different things. Uh -huh. Like I'll have native students in the AIS classes who are very, uh, you know, enthusiastic and passionate about American Indian Studies uh, classes and content. Some of them have taken such classes in high school. Most not. Uh, and then I'll have then I'll have American Indian Studies Native students who have never taken any kind of Native Studies class, mm -hmm. and who you know will say like, well, we know we're Lumbee, but we never really studied about it or anything like that. So um, the actual course content for a lot of these courses is new to them, or mm -hmm. nobody's ever really told them about other tribal nations or that there is a body of Native American literature, for example. So uh -huh. it's, a, it's a real range. And then the non-Native students who take, especially the intro class, mm -hmm. uh, I love teaching that class too because I have all different kinds of students, first year and then some seniors who just need a <laughs> class to graduate, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, but consistently those students are awakened and enlightened in ways when they learn, you know, the histories of Native peoples and their contemporary experiences. That class isn't a history class per se. We have mm -hmm. two history classes for American Indian um, history, mm -hmm. but the intro class is really focused on contemporary Native people's experiences and how history informs those experiences. So, you know, um, a lot of students don't even know that there's this huge diversity of tribal nations and that they're doing all of these uh, activities, um, food sovereignty, which we'll talk mm -hmm. to talk about in a minute, but so it's, it's a real range who takes the courses, and I'm always happy that, that people with very little experience take them and people who have had some background. Whoever comes, I'm really happy. Great. That's so exciting that people buy into it. Um, since you mentioned Native Foodways, I hear your 10th annual anniversary yes. of AIS honoring Native Foodways event is in November. Yes. What's going on with that? Yeah, we're really excited about that. The, this event started as a, just a very small scale potluck. Um, the first one 10 years ago was in the, then it was called the Multicultural Center, now it's called the Office of uh, Diversity and Inclusion. Mm -hmm. And it was just, I don't, a few of us in Old Maine, basically, the building that we're in now, um, who decided to have a foods potluck with featuring traditional native foods mm -hmm. and focus on healthy ways to prepare them. So it was fun and it was, like I said, small, maybe, maybe 30 people came. Mm -hmm. um, now it's grown over the years. We've had a lot more publicity. We've had a lot more help. It's for the entire community, the campus community, the local community, anybody. The past, the past two years we've had actually school kids from like Wilmington area oh, wow. um, come, you know, bus in here for this event. They're also, I think, you know, looking at the campus or whatever, uh -huh. but they make a point of doing it on the day that we have Honoring Native Foodways um, because of what we do. Now, these photos that you're seeing are actually uh, of a new project that we've started. It's called the Honoring Native Foodways Cooking Club. And we've only had one meeting uh, that was the week of Hurricane Florence. So things got put on hold, but this was mm -hmm in the chancellor's residence. Um, oh, great, that's it exciting. It was great, yeah, and um, <laughs> Mrs. Cummings, who's in this photo right here, she was so 
uh, gracious and positive to allow us to use that wonderful kitchen over there. Mm -hmm. And this group, it's, it's, we're keeping it kind of small now just to see how it goes, but it's students, staff, and faculty who are interested in this larger concept of um, food sovereignty, which really is, it, it's an old concept, but uh, it sort of formally became an entity by that term in the, in the 70s. And what food sovereignty means essentially is uh, people in a, in a particular locality having, it's a human right to have food that's grown in a healthy way, um, that's culturally appropriate, uh, that the, the labor that's used to produce the food is equitable and socially just, mm -hmm. and that there's access to everyone in the community for the food sources. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of philosophy of food sovereignty. And there's a group of us um, who received a Teaching and Learning Center grant this mm -hmm. semester who are collaborating on some of these activities, including that uh, Honoring Native Foodways Cooking Club, okay. um, Dr. Beasley in nursing, Dr. Jacobs and I in AIS, and Dr. Connor Sanderfer, who was in one of those photos, uh -huh. in biology, because we're all interested in this, <clears throat> pardon me, um, you know, the, the food traditions and the food itself, but also the health benefits. Right. Uh, because Native peoples and all of our diets, but Native peoples in particular, their diets and health have been very impacted by the, the colonial diets mm -hmm. that have been imported um, and prevented them from accessing their food sources. So on November 8th, that's uh -huh. the Honoring Native Foodways event. That's the, that's the 10th anniversary. Uh, and we have this rock star indigenous cuisine chef. His book was pictured in one of the photos earlier, his name is Sean Sherman, and his cooking company is called The Sioux Chef, mm. S-I-O-U-X, <laughs> play on words if you're a foodie and know about sous chefs. Yeah. Um, and his book last spring won a James Beard Award, and he has been doing an amazing job traveling globally and doing cooking demos and presentations in all kinds of communities, but primarily native communities, using their local foods and helping people understand how, what they have in their region that's traditional, how to prepare these foods in healthy ways and delicious ways. I mean, it's, it's fabulous cuisine, mm -hmm. you know, he'll use all kinds of ingredients, but his cookbook has nothing that's a Western Im dietary import. He doesn't use any dairy, he doesn't use any white flour or white sugar, mm -hmm. and he doesn't use any, um, Oh, like he doesn't use chicken eggs he uses, uses duck eggs and oh. for sweetener he uses maple sugar and maple syrup all, all foods that are indigenous to North America uh -huh. so he's going to come and do a food demo at Native Foodways this year and then the night before November 7th Wednesday at 6 p.m. 6 p.m. in the uh, Museum of the Southeast American Indian he'll be giving a public presentation and signing his book. That's, both of those events are free, open to the public, and we would welcome anyone who has an interest to come and join us at those. That's so exciting. Yeah, we're I, really excited. I didn't excited. know this was happening either. I want to ask you, though, just out of my own interest and maybe some of our viewers, do you know of any specific dishes? You know, what has been created so far in oh, that I club? Oh, I know a lot of dishes. So there, in that photo, so for that event, we had um, salmon that was baked. Mm -hmm. We had a... One person in the cooking club made what's called a three sisters mash. Three sisters uh, in native cuisine are corn, beans, and squash. Those are mm -hmm. foods that have traditionally been grown by certain tribal nations, but, but many, um, Southeast included. And they're grown together because their, their effect on each other during growth is, um, promotes growth in each of those different foods. But oh yeah, there's the picture again. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so yeah, that was delicious. We had some um, manaman, that's the Anishinaabe word for wild rice. That's okay. a huge food of the, of the um, Anishinaabe peoples. We had some yams there. We had a, um, a salad that had like zucchini and, and uh, wild rice and different kinds of vegetables. Um, I'm trying to think what else we had. Lots of good stuff. I mean, for proteins, there's elk, there's duck, there's um, moose. We don't have that around here. <laughs> but uh, I think he, I think Sean Sherman's going to make a rabbit dish. Don't Ooh. hold me to it. But um, <laughs> we might be cooking some rabbit, uh -huh. uh, corn, anything with corn, cornmeal, cornbread. We'll be having that, mm -hmm. but not using white flour. So okay. he uses um, nut meals instead as flour. Uh -huh. So. It's, it's very delicious food, and you feel good after you eat it. You really do. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope you can 
come and, and have I'll some be there. Samples. I'll be there. It good, good, good. <laughs> um, you mentioned too just a moment ago about this grant that you got for the Teaching and Learning Center that yes. combines many different disciplines. Yes. How did you come about applying and receiving that grant? Well, you know, it's interesting on this campus, as I'm sure you know, there are people who are often doing things similar to you or that share an interest, but they're in a different department. So it becomes hard to know who's doing what. So, mm -hmm. so somehow, I mean, um, Dr. Terry Beasley and Dr. Connor Sanderfer and Marianne Jacobs and I, we, we all kind of um, figured out through just conversations and knowing each other that we all had an interest in native foods mm -hmm. coming at it from our different disciplinary perspectives. So we said, okay, what would it look like if we applied for a grant that would allow us to develop a curricular piece so that um, Dr. Jacobs and I in AIS could go give a presentation about traditional foods and the health benefits of those pre-colonial contact to nursing students and to biology mm -hmm. students, and then have a biology prof, Connor, come to AIS and say, yeah, here's the epigenetic effect of those foods uh -huh. from the biology perspective. And then Dr. Beasley, um, she's coming to my class next week, but talk about you know, um, some health markers, uh, nutritional health markers and their relationship to the local community, um, which is significant you know, to nursing students and to all of us. Mm -hmm. So that, that was sort of the, the seed, pun mm -hmm. intended, of the, <laughs> of the idea for yeah. the grant. And then we, we realized, well, if we do that and we, um, we could use some of this grant money also to bring Sean Sherman um, for the Foodways event mm -hmm. and kind of link these things together. And, out of, and the cooking club was sort of a separate idea that some, that some of us have been talking about. I'm like, well, that fits with this whole larger vision, too. So yeah. it, it's really exciting because I think a lot of us have been wanting to do a lot of these things collaboratively for a long time. It, it, it's hard sometimes to just keep doing new projects yourself. Uh -huh. So this has been very invigorating for all of us and it's a long-term thing mm -hmm. the grant is only one semester but the concepts for continuing to do different projects around food sovereignty um, food justice and and health in the community mm -hmm. featuring traditional foods that's going to be ongoing yeah because i imagine that once you have even just this little bit of grant money to get started to get invigorated yes. um, to be fulfilled in this project how can you stop right it, it's hard not it's hard not to keep going and you know the more people who learn about it mm -hmm. i mean we have um mrs cummings is on board she's uh -huh. really interested she's part of the we have a food sovereignty shared interest group that's another teaching and learning center uh, kind of just a i don't know i guess a think tank mm -hmm. where people come together um, who are interested in a concept so we have different people who come to that as well uh, we've been invited the the four faculty in the in the food sovereignty cohort we've been invited to give a presentation at davidson college next week oh great on this a symposium it's going to last all day and we're going to give presentations and do a workshop and mm -hmm. show some um some film clips about um, food sovereignty so yeah i hope the word gets out and and that more people th the goal of course is to have people think about what they eat how they produce how what they eat is produced and mm. and ultimately the goal is health yeah health and mindfulness health right? and mindfulness um, and yes. we're all headed in that direction culturally right or i hope i hope uh, <laughs> i hope that's I hope. the goal yes uh moving forward i think to like a more global concept right because you did mention that to me about we are very locally based yes. particularly because of the community that we're in but there's a great study abroad program out of AIS, right? Yes, there is. Uh -huh. uh, this is called the uh, International Indigenous Exchange Consortium. It's got Ooh. one of those very <laughs> long, fancy college names. Uh -huh. uh, it's been five years in the making, four until we took our first trip last summer. So this grew out of uh, Dr. Jacobs and my interest in collaborating with another indigenously based institution outside of the U.S. We mm -hmm. had had a partnership several years ago with a, a college in Canada and we did a couple of activities but some things didn't come together so that didn't work out but we wanted to continue to pursue that so uh, I, I contacted a friend of mine who's a faculty at the Univers University of Saskatchewan in Canada mm -hmm. Dr. Robert Innes um, a lovely person great scholar and I said hey you know do you have any, do you know anybody who'd be interested in this? And basically he said, yes, I do. And meanwhile, we've been doing uh, work with 
um, a university in Australia and Hawaii. So do you mind if they join? Oh. And I was like, <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, I don't. Oh. So this has, this has evolved into a, we believe it's the only, it's the only one to our knowledge that exists um, oh. in the world, which is a, an international consortium uh, that focuses on study abroad and scholarly collaboration between four international indigenous institutions. Mm -hmm. So this, these are institutions that either have a large indigenous population or are located in an indigenous community or both. Mm -hmm. So we did our first study abroad trip last year. That's our gang arriving in Saskatoon after a, a very early flight and many <laughs> transfers. But anyway, we, we had um, Dr. Jacobs and I went with five students. And they all happened to be native students last summer. Uh, they weren't all well, actually, they all were AIS majors, but, <laughs> but this program is open to anybody, and mm -hmm. we definitely hope that all kinds of students take the class. So we, it's in the summer, and we do some online work um, to the faculty at the host institution. So mm -hmm. this time, Saskatchewan faculty created the curriculum that all four of us taught at our different institutions at home mm -hmm. before we traveled so that every all of us had background on the indigenous histories of the place we we're going to oh, great and then we meet up um, at the host institution and for this trip we were on the road for six days oh. we were there for 10 days two and two um, you know at the university at the beginning and the end sort of intro and wrap up and then we traveled together for six days these are on Poundmaker Cree homelands um, all that yellow that you see is canola. That's not indigenous. It's very pretty, but it's not an indigenous plant. <laughs> but it was pretty to travel on. So we, we traveled to different homelands um, of the Cree people. We also uh, we camped out for several days. This was a, a Cree medicine person who was giving us some traditional ecological knowledge about the, the plants that Cree people and other um, native people of Saskatchewan have used over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, this person is Maria Campbell. She's, she's a shero of mine because <laughs> she, I've been teaching her autobiography, which is called Half Breed, in my native lit class for like 20 years. Wow. Anyway, mm -hmm. she uh, she's, was friends with the faculty in Saskatchewan, so we were invited to camp at her home place. Uh -huh. She's Métis, which is another um, indigenously recognized nation uh, of Canada. Mm -hmm. So we were able to uh, meet with her, and she was so gracious. That's our group at her home place. We've spent a lot of time under that arbor sharing mm -hmm. stories. Um, and you know, for, for our students to meet students from Australia and to meet students from Canada, it's so important for those students to learn about global indigenous experiences and, and compare and share their own. Um, it, it opens their minds to shared indigenous experiences, mm -hmm. things that have, that have been consistent. Uh, but also the particularities of their own tribal nations and right. native communities. And then they bring that knowledge back here. So I think that, that it really benefits everyone. Yeah. Um, and our students started to imitate the, like, the speech of the Australian students. Huh? And the Australian students started to imitate their southern accent. So it was kind of Wow. Fun. There was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, amidst the learning, there was a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, that's what it's all about it in the is. end. It is. Um, I think you even brought for us today some footage I from did. those experiences. Yes. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that before we watch it? Together? Sure. So, uh, you know, we would go, as we traveled, we would meet with elders or specialists from the particular nations and experience some of the cultural um, events and learn about the land. And then things that were happening um, just while we were there that had nothing to do with our trip, we also uh, attended some of those events as well. So the first mm -hmm. clip you'll see is of the Red Pheasant Cree Nation powwow. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'll see some fancy dancers there in their beautiful, brightly colored regalia. Mm -hmm. And then that's followed by a short clip of some people jigging at huh. Maria Campbell's place. So. Uh, jigging is a is a Métis traditional dance, but it incorporates like uh, th their heritage includes Scots, Irish, and kind of a, a, a mixture of indigenous and Scots and French people. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's part of their heritage. So that's what you will see in the second short clip. Great. Now, if we can, we'll watch that uh, those video clips.
That's so awesome. It was fun. Yeah, and when you mentioned um, Scots Irish, that's not not too dissimilar from Lorenberg, right? From, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Interesting, that crossover there. And and some of the jigging might look like clogging even, which is very popular around here. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, not to shift the focus toward anything colonial, but, but it's interesting. Well, there, there's a lot of, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of imported um, traditions in indigenous experience. There are a lot that are claimed on indigenous terms, which mm -hmm. is very interesting to see. And that's yeah. part of Métis history. Yeah. Yes. That's so great. What, what has been your favorite part of that's the study abroad so far? And what are you looking forward to in the future? You've got some big plans coming up, right? Yes. Yeah, so, so I mentioned that we have, um, we're a consortium of four schools. So each summer, a different of the institutions will be rotating over the next four summers. And then we'll see where we are and, and start again or whatever. So next summer, we're going to Melbourne, Australia. Mm. Um, and we're going to have a more urban experience there, which will be very interesting because I think our students here don't really, um, haven't been exposed to a lot of urban native experience because we're a rural community. Then the following summer we will host uh -huh. students from those institutions and then the fourth summer we'll go to um, the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh -huh. So, I mean, my favorite part is, uh, for, selfishly, I love yeah. the travel. I love. I love meeting new people and hearing, you know, their stories and having experiences with them. But, but also as an educator, it's very exciting for me to see students who maybe have never traveled at all mm -hmm. um, have that experience from how do you go through TSA and customs, those very kind of basic things to meeting people in a, in a global arena and, and finding out that they have so many similarities uh, in their heritage, even though they're you know, um, oceans and, and hours apart. Yeah. And That's what we really assume exciting. to be worlds apart, right? But yes. It's not. Yes. It's not. They always find connections immediately. Mm -hmm. And that's really fun to see. Do you still have openings for, um, the trip next oh, yes. summer? We haven't even, we haven't even opened up the course yet. Yes, we do, but it's really limited enrollment, uh, five, maybe six students, but we would encourage anyone who's interested to, to apply. Mm -hmm. And how do they get in contact with you? You can find me uh, on the American Indian Studies homepage on the faculty site, or you can email me, and that's H-A-L-A-D-A-Y-J at uncp.edu. Great. Thanks so much, Jane, for talking to us thank today you, Hannah. about all this awesome stuff. Um, and thank you to our viewers uh, for joining us today on Campus to Community. Uh, join us next time, and we will continue to talk about service learning and service learning faculty and students this semester. I'm Hannah Baggett-Anderson. See you next time.